Our panelists today cover a impressive range of musical professions. Gerald Fitzgerald is associate editor of the magazine Opera News. George Jelinek is music director of radio station WQXR and host of two weekly radio programs, The Vocal Scene and Music Magazine. And Spate Jenkins is a music critic and lecturer who is also right now working on a book about opera from the point of view of the singer. So gentlemen, now we will go on to the point of view of our listeners with a question we started uh, the other day but never really got into. It's from David Scott of Merrick, New York, about opera characters who have a story to tell but who have to be coaxed or urged to tell their story, even if it's a surefire applause-catching uh, number. I'm going to quote the coaxing, urging words that lead to an operatic narrative. You are to tell us who responds in what opera and with what famous, tuneful narrative. And of course, if you'd like to sing, please feel free. <laughs> now, who coaxes whom with the words, speak, we are alone? Carla Siamsoli. Mr. Jelinek. That is uh, Rigoletto telling Gilda in the second act of the opera. Right, you no are. singing. And uh, why does he want her to speak, and what does she tell well, him? Well, uh, this brief? is, uh, he suspects that she has a very uh, sad and involved tale, and he had just gotten rid of all the courtiers, and thereupon Gilda tells him uh, her tale of seduction by the Duke. Beginning with the words? Uh, I'm sure you uh, remember. Tempio. Uh, yes, right. Uh, Mr. Jenkins, the that's one. First word is Mr. Fitzgerald. Well, the name of the aria is Tutti le feste al tempio. Tutti le feste al tempio. Yes, there we are. All right. Now, our next character urges in almost the exact same words. Now we are alone. Tell me that tra tragic story. Soli or siamo de narra quella storia funesta. This is in a... Opera by the same composer, as a matter of fact. Composed... Uh, Sounds like Il Trovatore. Quite right. And uh, it's one Dr. of Atucena's uh, stories, I believe. Uh, Manrico is asking Atucena to tell him the confused uh, story of his origin and whose son he is and so on and so forth. And yes. that leads to either Strida la Vampa or uh, Condotte Alera in Ceppi, one of the two. The, the second one is right, and will you translate what is uh, that, that says? Is, that is, uh, she right? talks about her mother. She was carried away in chains. To the funeral. To the, fu to the uh, pyre. To the pyre, yes. All right, now in a very different type of opera, who urges whom with the words, tell me about that strange event? Narratemi lo strano avvenimento. This, uh, I might say, is... Uh, the answer to this is a rather long and very dramatic recitative followed by a famous aria. Mr. Jenkins, I think, has... I, I wonder if that is Don Giovanni. You are wondering correctly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but now it's not I answer the right one. I think it's probably... I think it's, Orsai, I think it's the intro to Orsaica Lenore. Yes, would you tell us just oh, oh, briefly Otavio. what the situation because is? Because Otav because uh, when when Don Giovanni uh, has said to them, Don Giovanni in, comes in and sees Ottavio and Anna. They come on to Don Giovanni after he's already been in trouble with Elvira and Zerlina, mm -hmm. and he talks to them, tries to quiet them down. And as he as he leaves, uh, as, as he leaves, he says, "Amici, addio." And the sound of his voice, Anna turns to Ottavio and says. That's the man who did it. He's the one that killed my father, and so on and so forth. And, she, and he says, tell me the story. And then he begins, or sight, and then she tells the long rest it, and then... Good for you. Are, You've yeah. uh, disentangled that beautifully. <laughs> 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 now, we have uh, one last, uh, a very passionate narrative is prompted by this question. Why did you signal to me to be silent? Perché mai fatto segno di tacere? This is one of the bread and butter operas, sometimes referred, one of them is referred to as ham and eggs. 
Miss uh, Fitzgerald? I think that is Santuzza talking to Mama Lucia. And Mam Mama Lucia Correct, has says... been having traffic with Alfio, who's the husband of Lola, who is double timing him. <laughs> and um, Santuzza nearly gives the whole thing away by saying that Torito is back in town or whatever, and uh, really scandal could ensue because everybody evidently is misbehaving. So when the two women are left alone... She says, and then she sings, of course, to get her applause, she sings Boy Lo That is the answer. Big, <laughs> which means, you know it so well, Mama. And then... <laughs> <laughs> And she tells her what Mama didn't know at all, of course. <laughs> all right, according to Frank Baldanza of Bowling Green, Ohio, one of the more endearing features of opera is that often when a large chorus is bent on mischief or murder, they caution each other to be very quiet or sometimes entirely silent, and they sometimes do it in absolutely thunderous tones, <laughs> or at least loud enough to be heard very clearly through a large auditorium like the Metropolitan and frequently at length it shows more enthusiasm than discretion. So, Mr. Baldanza asks you to listen to the music of some of these excitable conspirators and tell us who is conspiring to do what in which opera. Mr. William Vendice, an assistant conductor at the Metropolitan Opera, is at the Knabe to play us the first of these shushing choruses. Just to... In It's an opera that's not currently in the Metropolitan Repertory. It was once very popular, yes, Mr. Jenkins? I think all I can say to that is it's very pretty. He plays it very nicely. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Fitzgerald? I don't know, but I'll make a guess. Uh, the music is funny to me, to my ear, and so it may be Rossini. <laughs> no, it's uh, a composer who overlapped with Rossini chronologically, Mr. Jelinek. Uh, I'm guessing too. Uh, I think this is unintentionally funny. Yes. And I think that it's Verdi, and I think it's Ernani. It's very close in style. I'm sure that Verdi often had this scene. It was a very famous scene, <laughs> and it is Maya Bear. Oh. Uh, can you guess what famous conspirator scene it is? Then it has to be the in the Zigano. Right. That has conspiracy to spare, and it's. Uh, either the uh, Protestants against the Catholics or the other way around. Yes, it's the Catholics who are plotting, and in this particular scene they tell each other to be very, very quiet, and then they suddenly say, it is the will of God, Julliver, and that's where this big outburst comes, and they suddenly again very quiet. All right, uh, we have uh, another one, Mr. Vendicher, please. Gerald? Well, that's Rigoletto, which everyone knows. We don't get to hear Le Huguenot so much, but we do hear Rigoletto. And this is the um, band of men led by Marullo from the Duke of Mantua's court. And they are encircling Gilda's house, and they want to abduct her and take her off to the palace. Which they... CTCT piano, piano, doing, you know, yes. whatever they sing. CTCT, be quiet, quiet, quiet. Right. And then there's a couple of sudden uh, outbursts that they can all right, uh, we have a, uh, another Italian opera, Mr. Vendice. raised his hand. I yes. raised my hand because I, I want to say Lucia, but I can't for the life of me put the place, put the exact chorus where it is in Lucia. He's a famous rival of uh, that composer. It's not Lucia? Uh, Mr. Jelinek. 
It, it's Norma. It's Norma. Correct. Uh, and but I is... can't immediately place it either. Ah. Uh, yeah, it's well, probably the, 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 the uh, warriors, uh, the druids, uh, right. walking away at the, at the urging of uh, Oroveso. Yes. But I don't remember the scene exactly where it is. Mr. Jenkins. I think I'll make another mistake on it. I think it's in the fourth act. I think it, I think it's the moment when they leave. Uh, I think when all of the when all, they leave after, or are these those things before you have the scene with Norman Polioni? No. Yes, yes. It is. It is the last act, and it's he. he has, Polioni, um, Oroveso, Papa, the high priest, has the aria Adel Tebro, and uh, this is the preparatory section leading into it. All right, we have one more that is perhaps more familiar. Mr. Jelinek. That's uh, from Il Trovatore. This is the scene with Count Di Luna just before the proposed abduction. Yes. Uh, after following the aria, uh, the baritone aria, I don't know why today none of these words come to mind, which I've known all my life. I think, <laughs> I know, of course you do. Balen. Yes, Mr. Like you. <laughs> you say it again so we can all hear. Il Balen is yeah. the aria which is followed by this scene. Yeah. In today's opera, we all know that Elizabeth represents pure love, while the pagan goddess Venus represents sensuous love. And Tannhäuser, of course, is torn between the two. Estelle Gilson of the Bronx, New York, puts it this way. Tannhäuser loves Venus most of the time, while protesting that he really loves Elizabeth. Tannhäuser's best friend, Wolfram, also loves Elizabeth. In fact, he worships her with an idealistic love which he expresses in the last act in his f famous song to the evening star. Now, Miss Gilson has a rather penetrating question for you. Didn't Wagner know that the evening star is Venus? <laughs> and if he did know, was Wagner being cynical when he made Wolfram sing the praises of both Elizabeth and Venus at the same time? Or was he being philosophical and trying to tell us something about the nature of uh, love? Mr. Jenkins? Well, I, th I think this is interesting because there's a lot of research on almost every aspect of Wagner, but you don't find anything about this, I think, in the Wagner literature and what he wrote. His instructions on Tannhäuser do not get into this at all, right. which I think two things can be said about it. One, in Tannhäuser and in all his operas, he sometimes didn't round the ring. He didn't make it completely sure. Uh, he didn't make his stories completely work because he had an idea he would move with them. Now, I'm asking you, did, do you mean that he, he was a little bit inconsistent or inconsistent. that he simply didn't spell everything out? He didn't spell everything out, and oftentimes he was inconsistent. I see. And secondly, I think it's interesting to know whether, whether it has to be Venus. In German, the Abendstern means Venus or another star. In other words, there's another star. If, if Venus, for instance, isn't up, if there's one of the other planets up, it can be another star. I mean, it's not absolutely necessary to translate Abenstern as Venus. Ah, uh, well, I, I stand corrected. I thought the evening star was always Venus, but uh, Mr. Fitzgerald. All this is too um, psychological or, or erudite for me. I think that in, when Wagner was writing this particular opera, he was really very much following in the path of Weber and other composers of that period. It was the Romantic era and they painted very much nature pictures. And I think that he came to a certain moment where he had twilight and he had a b beautiful moment in which he could express something of nature. And that star only means that, and it was something beautiful that uh, uh, this minstrel could sing his uh, song of love to. Well, you're undoubtedly right about the nature uh, depiction. Yes, song Mr. Delanac. I agree with uh, Mr. Fitzgerald here because uh, the year of Tannhäuser is 1844 and I think it is uh, presuming almost too much of Wagner to have been an expert in both astronomy and psychology. Uh, psychology not having arrived on the scene at that moment of history. I'd yeah. rather think of uh, Wagner as a study uh, from a psychological point of view, as the object of study rather than being the psychologist himself. Yes. And I feel that it's, it's a little uh, reading into matters. I think it's a matter of an opportunity for him to write a beautiful melody to the evening star. And I don't think he thought 
of the evening star in terms of Venus. Yes, Mr. Fitzgerald? I just want to make a point. Is that um, Venus is the pagan goddess from yeah. the Latin um, climes, and maybe the whole idea of who these are do not relate to North myth mythology. And so it would have nothing to do with with Wagner, I don't know. Well, actually there, no, the uh, the pagan, the, the classical gods and goddesses survived, but as demons. So they were, in the Middle Ages, they were regarded as, so this would have been an evil goddess of, of lust and, uh, yes, Mr. Jenkins. Well, under any condition, Wagner didn't mind uh, crossing a lot of T's and dotting I's, and if he'd really wanted to make this with Venus, he would have used, I think, used the word in it. I mean, after all, all it is is Abenstein. That's what he mm -hmm. keeps saying. There's no suggestion that Wagner is confused about it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why you, that's why you just have to accept it as, as probably what, what Jerry says, or, you know, if that's the way it was. He just did it, he was moved by it, and he did it. Well, I think that's, uh, you have to accept it, but I, I also, he didn't always spell things out, and he did write himself something about the overture to Tannhäuser, which he, in which he says the end represents the senses and the spirit being, uh, the Venusberg music and the Pilgrim's Chorus are combined, and he says this was meant to be symbolical, and this is the embrace of the senses and the spirit and God and nature, and mm -hmm. uh, everything is reconciled, which is a rather modern-seeming uh, uh, point of view. So it's, he might have had this in mind even in the Evening Star. Uh, Questions and answers on our opera quiz can be all in good fun sometimes, but in opera itself, questions and answers can have devastating results. Ernest D'Amato of Maplewood, New Jersey, wants you to tell us who asks the following questions in what operas and what far-reaching results does each question have. Now, here's the first one. Can you also make yourself tiny and small? Now, all the hands <laughs> zipping up, <laughs> Mr. Jenkins. Uh, that's the, the Mima says it in, to Albrecht in Rheingold, because he wants, he's already, Albrecht has showed that with the Tarnhelm he can be a dragon, and so the idea now is he wants to make him little because he knows he can get him if he's little, or he thinks he can, and so he does say yes and turns into a toad, and he does, in fact, capture him. Yes, good for you. Right. Who asks, uh, will you come to dinner? <laughs> Mr. Jelinek, again all the hands. Well, this is uh, uh, Don Giovanni, and uh, uh, Don Giovanni asks Leporello to in turn ask the statue to have dinner with him. And of course that re will result in his downfall, in his destruction. Absolutely, and even Don Giovanni himself finally repeats the, repeats the, the question, invitation. Because uh, Leporello is obviously very reluctant to ask that question. Yes, frightened to death. All right, who asks, what can you do for me? And why does that have serious results? Que peux-tu pour moi, is the question. Again, Mr. Jelen? That sounds like Faust. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, uh, and what, what far-reaching results does this uh, have? Well, he can do a great deal for him. For one thing, uh, Mephisto can rejuvenate him. Oh, he's asking Mephisto, isn't he? He's asking Mephisto that in the first act, and Mephisto can rejuvenate him, but he will have to pay very dearly for that. Namely? Namely, uh, losing his soul and uh, putting himself at the devil's service when the time comes. Yes. He says it very urbanely, doesn't he? He says, I will serve you up here, and blah, blah, pointing down, you serve me. All right, who asks, by what road shall we avoid the army legions? <laughs> Mr. Jenkins. I, uh, well